chat. Um, and then I will share my screen as well. Um, can someone please let me know if you're able to see the screen? Yep. Okay, awesome. And then I will ask that Jocelyn and Maggie as my co-host, if you could monitor um, as folks come in. Hey, awesome. So thank you all for joining us today. Our first event um, of this, uh, I want to say this spring cycle, a day in the life of a research specialist featuring Miss Barbara Williams um, from the UI Cancer Center. So Barbara Williams um, is MPH and is currently a research specialist uh, for the University of Illinois Cancer Center with a research concentration of colorectal health and smoking cessation. She currently serves as the core coordinator for various projects working alongside with community partners on the south and west sides of Chicago to engage and educate people in the community about the importance of preventative health screenings and smoking on smoking cessation resources. Barbara has always been passionate about health and community service. She received a bachelor's degree in community health in 2008 from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a master's degree in public health from DePaul University in 2013. Barbara has over 10 years of public health experience working in the fields of maternal and child health, dental care, cancer, diabetes, sickle cell disease, asthma, dementia, Alzheimer's, COVID, 19 HIV and AIDS. Her community service experience also includes being a team lead for patient navigation regarding breast, cervical, colorectal, and lung health at Mount Square clinic sites, um, Inglewood, Maine, and South Shore. She also served as a co-facilitator for the Freedom from Smoking program, um, and Barbara currently provides training to navigators, community health workers, and coordinators for funded programs on the importance of navigation, community engagement, and outreach. Um, Barbara J. Williams currently has her own business called Plus For You Wellness, um, where she does public health consulting and event planning, which partners with multiple organizations to educate individuals that will inspire inspire communities to live healthier lifestyles, advocate to receive quality health care, and provide guidance for resources and partnerships. As a public health practitioner, her background includes research, health education, case management, care coordination, community engagement, outreach, and wellness. Barbara strives to create new strategies that address quality care and education to prevent health disparities in marginalized communities. Barbara's spirit of giving back to humankind becomes evident in a quote, in a quote by Oprah Winfrey. My life's goal is to be of service to a greater good. Wherever that true calling takes me, I've been willing to go. I will now pass it off to Barbara. And let me also stop. My screen share and then um, Barbara, I will spotlight you. Okay. okay, so feel free to take it over. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. I truly appreciate it. Thank you, Northwestern University, for inviting me and being a part of this wonderful talk. Uh, as you know, my name is Barbara Williams, and I am a research specialist with the University of Illinois Cancer Center. And I want to talk about my journey. And my journey has so many twists and turns, but uh, I am grateful to where I am right now. And so uh, I just wanna just start, let's begin. So I graduated from the University of Illinois uh, Urbana-Champaign. But when I started, I started in 2004 in the summertime. I was a part of a bridge program and the bridge program was for students of color, so minorities. Uh, who either scored high on an ACT score or either had high grades or either one of them. So I got in from either uh, scoring high on my grades, but low in score for ACT. So I had a summer course. And so I am so grateful that I ended up. Oh, I hear an echo, sorry. Um, I, oh, I, I uh, basically went through the program. It's a summer program for eight weeks. And I met a lot of students and it was actually introduction for me to go into the program that I was going to get my bachelor's in. But it was basically a head start because I had the opportunity to get strengthening on my math courses, my reading, my comprehension, because I was a well excelled student in high school. I just didn't test well. And that's OK, because I'm here today and I have a master's degree. 
Uh, but what I want to encourage you is do never give up on your dreams. And so as I went in the bridge program, I learned how to better study, get better study habits, as well as to know how to balance because I was on my own. I didn't have my, my parents to wake me up to go to school. I didn't have uh, someone to tell me to go to class. So this is something that I had to learn and to be disciplined as a young adult. So as the summer course ended, I ended up going into my freshman year. And so uh, my first goal was to be a doctor, an MD. And so that's why I, I always my dream was to be an MD. And uh, I took a few courses for science courses. And some of them were very difficult and challenging, especially the biochem and the chemistry. And so I was like, well, maybe this is not the route that I wanted to go, but I always wanted to stay in the health field. And so I talked to my advisor and my advisor was saying, well, what about community health? I'm like, well, what is community health? I don't know, I've never heard of community health. So I did my research. And so when I did my research, I said, hmm, this is something that I really have want to do. It's education, it's still in the medical field. It's just not a, a doctor. And so what I did was I started taking classes in community health and I actually liked it. I had um, some classes for health education. I learned about community engagement, outreach. I learned about uh, bio like statistics and different things like that, epidemiology. So I took some courses on those things. And that really geared my passion for community health. And so I graduated uh, from two, in 2008 from my bachelor's in community health. And so then I started my first career in maternal and child health with Aunt Martha's and Martha's Youth Services Center. And so it's based, they have uh, multiple organizations, uh, but I was basically in the organization for, um, in the locations of Park Forest, o uh, Olympia Fields, and I was a maternal child health case manager. And I just fell in love because I worked with women who are high risk for pregnancy and infancy uh, for infants. And so I worked in high risk areas such as Harvey, Ford Heights, Sauk Village, Chicago Heights. And so what I would do is I would go to individuals' homes. This is pre-COVID, mind you, it was in 2008. And I would go to individuals' homes to talk about how to get prenatal care and postpartum care. And that is very crucial for women, especially if you're working in high risk communities where a lot of women or individuals don't seek care. It's important to get a primary care provider. And I'm going to stress that to you more as I talk, because primary care is important when you're going to get about seeing about your health. And so I talked to these women about going to get their care. How are they going to get their uh, prenatal vitamins or um, any other assistance that they need, resources? And I would establish good. Oh, she uh, looks so cute. I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, I, I heard something. Sorry. Um, so basically, I went to um, women's homes, and then also I was a doula. And a doula is a birthing coach. And I was so nervous for my first birth. I'd never been in a hospital with a woman before having a baby, but I got trained through Dona to get my certification to be a doula because that was the part of the Healthy Start program. The Healthy Start program is for high-risk women um, and children. And we followed up with the babies up to two years old. And so my first birth, I actually had seven births uh, total for doula as I was at Aunt Martha's. And so I, uh, it was very overwhelming. It, now some challenge I could tell you, there's times you had to spend hours in the hospital. You didn't know, especially if it was a woman's first birth, they could be in the hospital for 10 to 15, 20 hours. So definitely it's a lot of patience. Um, but at the same time, it was very rewarding because I got to see the family and a baby birth, my birth canal. That was part of public health for me. And I said, wow. And then I got to follow up with the baby up to two years old, going over ages and stages, education, making sure that they're um, in uh, services, if, especially if they're like uh, having developmental issues, such as uh, early intervention or a WIC 
for um, women, infant, and children for resources, making sure I signed them up for medical cards to get their medical care. So that was the start of my public health journey, my community health journey. And so I then had a desire to get a master's degree. So in 2011, I applied to get my master's at DePaul University. Now I was still in, I was still working full time as a case manager. So um, I'm very grateful that I had individuals like my supervisors to be flexible with my schedule. And so what I would do is I would go to work full time and then I would work um, and go to school in the evening. So the program that I was in at DePaul University, it was for working uh, students. So it was evening classes from six to nine, which I'm very grateful for. And so then I got to learn more about public health in a, a deeper realm. And I met different students from different backgrounds. And I also learned how to navigate through different systems. And I did my practicum in the HIV and AIDS field, uh, field different than maternal child health, but it still would deal with uh, women. And my practicum was on um, African-American women to seek to get medical adherence for HIV and AIDS. And so I did my practicum at the core center on the west side of Chicago. Now, let me tell you, I'm from the suburbs. I'm from Chicago Heights. Um, it was definitely a different eye opening for me. Um, just seeing different people, different backgrounds, being more open to the LGBTQ community. I learned a lot in that field. And I got my HIV testing training and uh, to test for individuals for HIV and AIDS. I learned so much in that field as well. And I did my uh, practicum and then I graduated from DePaul University uh, in 2013. So that didn't end my public health career then. So I was still working at Ann Martha's and I graduated in 2013. However, I got laid off in 2014. What do I do now? I don't have a job. I'm, you know, unemployed. But let me tell you something. It is very important to keep your connections. Public health may seem small, but it's really big. I would like to thank Dr. Tanya Roberson. I don't know if she's on here, but she was one of um, the individuals that I went to get my master's of public health uh, degree with. We uh, graduated in the same cohort. It was by grace of God that she told me, she was like, hey, we got a position open at UIC for um, African-Americans of loved ones uh, that care for dementia and Alzheimer's uh, loved ones. So what I do, I, I was only unemployed for maybe about a month, maybe it's two months at the most. I ended up going to UIC after I left my job at Aunt Martha's to work with African-American caregivers of loved ones who had dementia or Alzheimer's. And I was a part of a research study and I was a research specialist working in that field in the College of Nursing. That was definitely um, an eye opener as well because too, I had a grandmother, uh, God rest her soul, she battled with dementia. So it was very passionate to my heart. And so we had uh, focus groups such as um, not focus group, excuse me. We had two groups. We have a control group and we had an intervention group. And so we worked with four different churches to recruit individuals who were going to certain churches and who had loved ones with memory loss. And so I was part of the intervention group where we talked about end of life care plans, how to prepare for your loved one as they're transitioning. But the other group was the control group where they talked about caregivers caring for themselves. But none of the participants knew what group they were in, but we knew as researchers going in, um, depending on what location they were recruited at. But that was my first time experiencing uh, data because we had to do pre-tests and we had to do post-tests, baseline surveys. So I actually got to practice what I learned in my MPH degree and my bachelor's. So. Yes, like I was a case manager, but I really didn't have a lot of data experience. So moving forward, now I'm in the field of uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. So I tapped into that realm. And so then that was only part-time, but it was more than what I was making before in my full-time job at Aunt Marcus. So then I transitioned in 2015 
to a a uh, care coordinator, still with UIC. I've been with UIC for a while. So you're going to hear me say UIC for a, a long time. So I transitioned to a uh, care coordinator uh, as work with kids with diabetes, sickle cell, asthma, and prematurity. And this is very passionate because let me tell you something. Before I started my degree in public health, I was a patient at UIC. In 13, I was diagnosed with focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, which is scarring of the kidneys and protein of the urine. So it was a kidney disorder. And I was fascinated in public health back then in 13, well, in the health field. And now I ended up working at UIC in the PEDS because I was a PEDS patient. Now I'm working in PEDS. And um, glory to God, I don't have, my kidneys are normal functioning, but now I'm giving back to kids who are in the pediatric department. And so as a care coordinator, we would help individuals seek care. So our primary goal was to keep sick kids from getting in the hospital so frequently and using the ER as their primary. We would set them up with a specialist, making sure they go to their primary care provider. We would also in, in, uh, encourage family engagement and, and more high um, enrollment for school. Because the kids that we were dealing with, they had um, high uh, days that were missing from school, such as because they had sickle cell, they had asthma, prematurity, or um, diabetes. And so I was a care coordinator leading community health workers who were going to do home visits. And I had specialized in home visits because I used to do it back in the day when I was at Aunt Martha. So I had that knowledge. Now I can pass it on. So it's good to share the knowledge that you have and you never know when you're going to use it again. And so what we did was we had create care plans and I was a team lead working with um, the providers as well as nurses to talk about cases, high-risk cases for individuals that um, may have issues with either going to their provider or may not uh, know how to get their care or either even how to use their medications. And so that's when you had a care team. A care team is someone that works with the family, whether it could be a doctor, a nurse, a care coordinator, a community health worker, a physical therapist. So you're always, when you're in public health, you're going to be a part of a care team. And so you're going to be a valuable person to be a part of that care team because you're going to end up being able to bring in resources where you're connecting with the family, as well as you're connecting with your provider or the, the patient's provider. And so uh, we worked in different parts of Chicago, and I really grew in that area uh, as a leader because I was a team lead of community health workers. And so, but that didn't stop there. <laughs> So now, as I grow in my public health field, I was in the pediatric check program for 2015 to 2018. Then I transitioned to the University of Illinois Cancer Center, where I currently am now, which I love the University of Illinois Cancer Center. I've been there for about four years. I started off as a patient navigator. And a patient navigator is someone where you, it's like an advocate. You help patients with resources, finding uh, education, linking them to care, helping schedule home vi uh, excuse me, uh, physical visits, such as like a screening um, or either going to a provider. So I specialized in breast, cervical, lung, and colorectal uh, screenings. So I work in the field of cancer. And I was a patient navigator from 2018 to about 2020 uh, before the pandemic. And so as a patient navigator, I really learned getting my foot and boots on the ground because I got to know the social determinants of health of why individuals were not going to their doctor's appointments. How can we help bridge the gaps between healthcare systems and patients and to be an advocate voice for a patient and to hear the other sides for the provider. So I was in this clinics for Miles Square, Inglewood, South Shore and Maine. And so those are certain parts of uh, Chicago that I was in the South side and West side linking individuals to care for either mammograms, colonoscopies for colorectal screenings and smoking cessation resources or cervical screening. So I wanna say first, cancer is very passionate to my heart. I've had family members that have had cancer such as my grandmother had had breast cancer. She was diagnosed at 65, stage four. She had a lump in her breast. 
they said that they didn't have, she didn't have much time to live. They had to remove one of her breasts and she also had um, a mastectomy and then chemo and radiation. Let me tell you something, she lived 17 years after that. They wanted her in a journal article. And I tell individuals who are going through treatment, because I've seen individuals that either don't want to know about getting a mammogram and they don't either, they're scared. They don't know what it feels like or they've seen someone go through cancer. And I use that story because it's all in your mind of how you're going to beat or how you're going to um, go forth and move to get screened. And so the youngest person I've seen with breast cancer is 25. Screening guidelines say you should be 40. As an advocate of young people, I tell people, do not take no for an answer. If you have a symptom in your body, if you feel something that's awkward, please see your provider. I'll tell you one another thing. My dad, he had colorectal cancer. He died of colorectal cancer. Colorectal is very passionate to me. He was high risk, African-American. Uh, and so as for me, I'm high risk because I had a, a family history and I'm African-American and my grandmother had breast cancer. I've gotten a colonoscopy and I got a breast mammogram and I'm under screening guidelines. And I'm, gl I'm glad to say I don't have any cancer. My, my health is uh, fine, it's good, but I advocated for myself. So in the field of public health, you have to advocate and regardless, you should not, regardless of your age, regardless of your sex, regardless of your race, you advocate for yourself. If you get no on the first answer, get a different opinion. But that is why I'm in the field of public health because I want people to know that there's resources out there. We have a program called My Mammo where we worked with individuals who do or do not have insurance to get mammograms. A lot of people think they can't get care because they don't have insurance. That's not true. We have the services and the needs for people to help. And that's why I'm doing the, the work that I'm doing. I'm going out into the field and telling them, hey, we have a program for you, even if you don't have insurance to get your mammogram, you can go get screened. Some people don't even know what a mammogram is. One woman, she told me she doesn't want to know. She saw somebody that went through breast cancer. You're not going to reach everyone. That is a challenge. You may not reach everyone because one woman told me I'd rather die by a bullet than know that I have breast cancer. And that hurt my heart. It did. But because she saw someone that going through treatment, it scared her. So when you're in the field of public health, you're going to have people that just don't want to know. Some people don't want to go through the process. They don't want to go get tested. Um, but at the same time, there's also people that I've encountered that I've encouraged them to get tested and they were glad. And so another woman, I actually encouraged her to get a mammogram and she had nipple piercings and I had gave her some information because uh, sometimes in society, nipple piercings could seem to be a cool thing. But at the same time, people don't know the after effects that it could cause. And so when I talked to the woman about uh, getting a mammogram and she was in screening guidelines, she was very grateful. And we ended up walking her through the process of getting a mammogram screening. And so as a patient navigator, I also taught freedom from smoking classes. And freedom from smoking classes is for people that want to quit smoking. You have to be wanting to, you have to be willing to want to quit smoking. Some people, they just don't want to. They say, I'm good, I'm, I'm cool, I don't need to have that resource. Okay, well, I'm gonna help reach the people that do. And some people change their mind. You know, you have to be ready. We talk about, too, uh, the social determinants of health. We also talk about what is your stages of preparation, the transitional model. And so are you in preparation? Are you in contemplation? Are you in maintenance? I mean, there's certain types of uh, levels that people go through when they're trying to change a behavior habit. And so uh, currently right now, I am a research specialist. That's how I'm leading up to. Um, so right now I do work with uh, colorectal screenings and smoking cessation. So I worked in a couple of uh, projects for example, connecting for lung health. I still do smoking cessation, but how I learn and how I teach is I incorporate a fun learning interactive game. So I do a smoking cessation bingo for individuals and I go to certain uh, communities 
um, and in mostly like housing facilities that have a lot, maybe a lot of smokers to incorporate a game format to learn resources of in terms of smoking cessation or uh, how smoking can affect someone's health. Because I feel that sometimes when you lecture to somebody, too many people, and you lecture for a long time, you lose them. But if you have interaction and you play and have a game and make it fun, that gets individuals to learn more and they get to play and participate. And so I do that. And then also um, I collect data. Uh, right now, too, we work with barbers and beauticians on the south side of Chicago, encouraging individuals to get screened. Uh, we have Project You Can where we uh, had fit testing and fit testing is a, a blood stool sample test for individuals to test for colorectal. And so those are for average risk individuals. Uh, so a uh, blood stool sample test is fit. So you take it home and you collect a piece of stool on a card. You take a little stick and you put a stool sample on the card. You either mail it back to your provider or you either um, bring it back to your provider to see if you have blood in your stool. And that is a one uh, colorectal screening uh, for a form. And so those are for average risk individuals. So that means average risk, you don't have a family history, you're not experiencing any blood or um, inflammation, or anything like that. But if you're high risk, such as myself, uh, you would go straight to colonoscopy, which is a more invasive test, which you would have to fast 24 hours in advance because your colon has to be clean for the provider to see everything on your next day, you would get placed in our light sedation about 45 minutes and there's this test where you have a um, microscope, it's with the flashlight and goes up your rectum to see if you have any polyps. And polyps can be cancerous or non-cancerous. Uh, and they need to be removed if you do have any polyps for, colon for colorectal, it's a colonoscopy. If so happens there's suspicion of cancer, then someone, uh, a provider will do a biopsy to test to see if it's cancerous. So, um, but if so happens the person that had the fit test was positive, they had blood in their stool, then the next step would be to get a colonoscopy. But those are things that I do in the community. And uh, I have three points that I want to make. Uh, when you're going into the field of public health, you wanna do your research. You want to know what field you want to do in public health. Uh, you want to know if this is something that you feel is passionate uh, that you can do and uh, work with individuals. Because in the field of public health, you have to be a people person. Um, I'm not going to say that you sit behind a desk all day unless you play with numbers. And there are some jobs in public health where you have epidemiology or statistics where you may not have to necessarily uh, deal with a lot of people. But in my position in a research specialist, I can do both. I do community engagement and outreach, and I also do in behind the scenes in the desk and collecting data as far as pre-test or post-test or screening. And then you also want to be authentic. When you're going into your communities, you want to make sure that you're authentic because community members know when you're not authentic and you're there just to collect data. And that's when you lose your trust in the community. You lose your trust in the community. I'm putting that together because I've seen some community members, they get um, their data or the data, data analysis, they may get their data and some community members may be confused. Like, well, where, what happened to my data? Where did it go? Or what was the outcome? It's very important when you're a research specialist to share what you found. And when you're going to communities, know your key stakeholders because your key stakeholders are people that are gonna connect you to the community members. You can't just go into a random community and you're not from there. They may not give you all the information. Everybody's not gonna be open with you. So when you find those key stakeholders, you definitely want them to um, know why you're going into your communities, do a community environmental scan, uh, do a community needs assessment. Those are things that you're doing your research on. And then you're also finding why you need to uh, research in that community. Maybe the cancer rate is high or maybe screening rates are low. What is the reason for you going in that community? And then once you collect your data, what did you find? Because in what resources can you bring to help bridge the gaps and barriers to care or bridge the gap where people can get more screened um, and not uh, ha and have lower cancer rates. And then the third thing is, I want you to be fluid like water. 
as a navigator and a resource specialist, it's nothing set in stone. There are things changed every day. Uh, policies change, education changes, communities changes. COVID-19, if that didn't teach anybody that change didn't happen, it does happen, okay? COVID-19 threw a lot of us off when it came to our data or projects. Some had to be put on hold, um, but we made it through and we actually rerouted and we did some webinars online, such as this. We're doing webinars. We're still in a pandemic, uh, but you have to be fluid like water because things change and you want to go with the flow and change and see what you can do to reroute to make sure you still reach your goal. And so coming forth, this is very passionate to me and I am very honored to speak here today for you to know that being a research specialist is passionate and dear to my heart. And I actually just got accepted to the PhD program for Community Health Sciences at UIC. So um, it's a doctoral program and I will be starting in August. And that is definitely <laughs> another big step because I see a need um, in the community and I want to do more. And uh, thank you. And I am willing to be the advocate that I need to get these resources in the community, as well as to see more individuals get screened and have longer lifespans. Because if there's nobody that's representing, especially in the communities of color underserved, we're gonna be lost. And I don't wanna be lost. We want to have people that thrive and I wanna be a representation and I want individuals to know the resources that are out there to live longer lifespans. And I have my own public health consulting business, which is Plus For You Wellness LLC, which I also do as a part-time for different organizations to work with other communities as well to get resources and consulting uh, out there and for event planning. So I thank you so much. <laughs> and um, uh, I will answer any questions that anyone has, because I know that there were some questions. Hi, yes, okay. So I will pass it off to Dalin, who will be in charge of our Q&A section. Yeah. Awesome. Hi, um, thank you so much for your story. I think it's super inspirational. I really appreciate all your life lessons so far. Oh, um, thank so you. Yeah, some of the participants wanted to ask, how did you get into public health counseling? Um, there's actually three questions in this one question. Um, one of them is, how did you get into the public health counseling? What are skills that are needed for counseling or consulting? Sorry. <laughs> um, what is it like owning your own business? Yeah. Okay. Well, I can go with one at a time. <laughs> so um, public health consulting is basically you help individuals. So I work with um, Tonoma Consulting, one of, that's one of my partners, uh, Dr. Lisa Ponte Soto is uh, the CEO. And I work with Illinois Unidos Coalition. And so we've actually helped with resources for COVID-19 to be utilized in a call center. And so consulting is basically where you're helping individuals that need additional help. So I do contracts. Um, I'm not a necessarily an employee, but I do contracts to help uh, meet the mission of the organization. So it could be someone that is a, a pharmaceutical company or a, a, it could be a medical a health insurance company. So I'm just there to help that to, if they don't want to hire a full time employee, I help with consulting on the side. Uh, what was the second question? I'm trying um, what skills are needed for consulting? Oh, what skills? Uh, definitely balance because you're on your own. You have to balance your time. You have to balance um, ways of how you're going to manage your money because how much do you charge because you are your own business and then working with the organization to see if you um, would take on the position because you have to look at your funds and what you charge or what the organization offers. Um, definitely you have to be a people person because uh, you're working with different businesses and different um, organizations. Uh, professionalism is definitely 
a high must. You have to go in. And then also for consulting, I do public talks. So uh, such as this or either um, like I've talked uh, for kidney talks before for my condition. Um, I've also talked to other college students. So I don't necessarily always be behind a desk, but I do public speaking engagements. Um, Consulting is very broad. It depends on how someone will want to make it. Uh, for me, I do event planning, speaking engagements, and consulting. So, yeah. And for the other question, what is it like owning your own business? It's wonderful because you get to pick and choose your hours. There's no set time. Um, definitely, I would say that was my goal as a young girl to also be an entrepreneur. Um, and more as a young adult. And me, I feel like being a millennial, a lot of our generation and back, they would want more creativity. I like to be creative when I'm doing my job or when I'm doing certain skills. And so uh, it gives me time to be creative and create content or create development and put my ideas out there. I don't like to be set in a box. That's not the type of person I am. I am more of, let me create things and do it something differently. I mean, there's nothing new around the sun, but at the end of the day, I still like to have creativity and own freedom. And so uh, I'm not full-time uh, my own business yet, but in the future, I plan to gear uh, more of that. But right now, um, it's just something that I do on the side, but it's, it's a good feeling. Thank you so much for, for your answers. Um, the next one is, were there any challenges while earning your NPH? Yeah, uh, time. I was really tired. <laughs> I was working a 40 hour job and then I had to go to school two days a week from six to nine. And I had to do a practicum um, for eight hours. So yeah, blood, sweat, tears went in that degree. Uh, time was definitely um, a challenge. And then plus I'm from the suburbs, I'm driving to the city back and forth. Um, there was definitely some classes that challenged me. I would say evaluation. I remember one time I wrote a paper, a 12 page paper. My teacher wrote and marked that all up and told me to rewrite it. I had tears welling from my eyes. And one of my classmates, she's like, Barbara, are you about to cry? I'm like, no, I'm not, but I really was about to cry. But I say, you know what? That's just gonna make me a better person. Because when you're in the field, in any field, I feel like you have to be open to constructive feedback and criticism. And that's something that I'm still growing in. But um, having that will help you grow to be better you as a person because you're not going to know it every you're not going to know it the first time. You're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect. Uh, but that definitely challenged me to do better. Um, so there were some classes that did challenge me, uh, like statistics as well. I'm more of a, a writer versus math, but um, I know with this PhD program is definitely going to challenge me in certain areas, but that's the only way I'm going to grow because if I stay in the same place, I'm not growing. And so that is going to continue to keep me uh, ahead of the game and uh, to continue to move forward and to grow. Um, yeah. And for the next one, when after your undergrad, did you pursue your master's? You said, I'm sorry, repeat that. I said, when after your undergrad did you pursue your master's? So I did my master's in 2011 to 2013. And then my undergrad, I graduated 2008. So um, about, and then, let me see. About four years, three, oh, four years. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think someone in the chat had asked this question. Um, they asked, how soon can you get a mammogram after breast? I would talk to your provider about that um, because if your provider is, uh, if you're depending on when you exactly start, I believe it's six months after, but like you said, I said your provider knows best in, the, in your body. So I would talk to your provider about that, but I believe it's six months from when you stop breastfeeding, you can continue for a mammogram. But like I said, check with your provider. And I think someone else um, put this in the chat and they were wondering about your business and if there was a website and if you could like link it in the chat or anything. Okay, I don't have a website yet, but I can put uh, my email in my contact information. 
uh, in the chat and I'll do that. Okay. It's in the okay. process. I'm working. I'm, yeah. I'm still working full time and doing a consulting business and <laughs> about to start school. So I got a lot going on, mm -hmm. but I don't have a website yet. For sure. Um, for the next one, some people are asking or wondering about what are some highlights from your career thus far? Highlights. So, oh, I did um, Bears Tackle on Cancer uh, two years in, two years in a row or three years. It's three years. And I worked with the Bears, Chicago Bears, and uh, Candace Henley, who uh, is the CEO of the Blue Hat Foundation, which is a colorectal uh, cancer advocacy program. And we actually, uh, a, a colorectal uh, organization, excuse me. And we actually celebrated cancer survivors and their caregivers. So the first year before COVID, uh, we did um, a event where we had like a tailgate party at the cancer center, which was so fun. We had food, we had music. We had Stanley the mascot, Stanley the mascot, the bear. And we celebrated cancer survivors and their caregivers because we want them to know that we appreciate them and their fight. And so then we took a bus all the way to Hallis Hall and we did some exercises with um, some former football players and Chris Draft uh, was the person that was the main um, person over there because uh, he organized this with the Chicago Bears and Candace Henley because his wife died of uh, lung cancer and she was not a smoker. And so he's very passionate about lung cancer and screenings. And so um, seeing that his wife was going through this, he wanted to celebrate cancer survivors. And it was just so many people there. I mean, it was from University of Chicago, Northwestern, University of Illinois, Cancer Center, um, and other organizations. And it was just a fun event, but it was also um, reminding me to celebrate life and to have others celebrate life uh, because you never know when your last day is. So you just want to celebrate while you can, especially if you are battling with cancer. That's not an easy task to battle. And so uh, just to seeing the, the cancer survivors going out there, having a good time and we're doing exercises. And then when COVID-19 happened, um, we did a virtual Bears Tackle on Cancer. The last time we did a smaller group. And then another highlight, um, I, I worked with uh, Sisters Working It Out. It's a breast cancer cancer uh, support group uh, and organization. And so I helped coordinate uh, with Beulah Brent, who is one of the, C the CEO of uh, Sisters Working It Out to work with women who are breast cancer survivors. Um, I loved working with the My Mammal program. And that was for breast health screening. Uh, we had uh, once a month, we had walk-in Wednesday, this before COVID, uh, we had women from all over coming in to get screened for mammograms. And sometimes we had to cut it off because we had women back to back to back, but we had it once a month uh, for women. And if they didn't have insurance, we still saw them. And so we had good partnerships too with oncology because Typically, if a woman has a lump in her breast, she doesn't go straight to regular mammogram. She goes to the next phase, which is a diagnostic and an ultrasound. And so when we had women coming in from all over and they said, oh, I identified a lump, then we would walk them upstairs and we had a good partnership with the nurse and the, and the medical staff and the doctors to get them in right away. And that's how we had some women identify that they didn't have cancer. And they didn't, some of them didn't even have insurance, but because we had that program in place that didn't stop them from knowing their breast health. And that's the rewarding part of my job is to get people help and to get the needs and the services that are provided that we can do for the community. Yeah, I think all those events sound like super inspirational, very touching. I think it's like great, the work that you're doing right now in the past. Um, for the next question, is what are things you enjoy in your current role and things that you don't like? Well, things that I don't like, I'll start with that because I'll end on a positive note. <laughs> um, sometimes it can be a little frustrating when you're not reaching a certain person. Um, some people are very stubborn. 
to want to get screened or they don't want to follow up with their appointments. Um, but you just have to see how you can reroute and try to see if a different plan can come in place. Um, also, sometimes you may not get through to a provider. A provider may have a different perspective than you as a, uh, a navigator or a research specialist. Um, so sometimes those moments can be frustrating as well as um, data. It could be a little frustrating as well for me. And some people are very data oriented. They love it. Me, it's not as much. <laughs> I mean, I know it's important and it's needed. Um, just entering all those pre-tests and post-tests can get a little tedious, but it's for data collection because we do do research. And um, I have been part of manuscript writing for journal articles. So that definitely stretches me and pulls me in different areas in different ways uh, to put my thinking cap on because uh, I haven't wrote uh, or written form paper form since like my master's of public health. So now I'm starting to do more writing. So that's a definitely a challenge uh, for me, but it's a good challenge. And then some positive things. Like I said, I, I enjoy community outreach and engagement. That is a passion of my heart. And that's why I'm continuing to do that work and to see people thriving. And I still talk to some survivors this day I still keep in touch with them, even though I'm not a patient navigator um, per se, but once in a while I may chat up with a patient like, hey, how you doing? Or if someone from the freedom from smoking classes, like I've had people that completely quit smoking. Some have rebound. That's a challenge, but you know, it's not easy to quit. But then the people that have quit and they continue to quit or stop, they're actually now advocates for the cancer center. So that's very rewarding for me um, as a facilitator. And I also worked with Ivan, um, who was another facilitator, Ivan Hall, uh, to help teach classes as well, and Paula Torres. And um, yeah, it's just to see if I can help one person a day, at least to get somewhere and to help them, I feel like I've accomplished my purpose for that day. That is my goal. I want to help more, but at least if I could do one, that would be, uh, that's beneficial for me. Uh, but community engagement and partnerships. I love having um, partners and just to see what else is out there because I like to have connections. Just like when I was telling you I was doing the uh, smoking cessation bingo, I was partnering with housing authority uh, organizations or um, community organizations uh, because we're getting our word out that we're not just in the health industry like clinics and hospitals, but we're going in the community, bringing those resources to people so they'll have some information to take home. And you never know, they may take it back home to their families. I've had people call me randomly. Um, one, one woman she got my flyer from a health fair event and her friend called me because her friend gave her the flyer because she had a lump and she ended up getting um, a mammogram screening. She didn't have uh, breast cancer, which is great, but because she had that uh, flyer, she was able to get screened because I don't believe, I think her insurance was off at the time or something like that. So you never know who you're going to reach and who you're going to uh, talk to, even if you didn't talk to them directly. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and then for these last two questions, um, how have you overcome the difficulties minorities and women face in the medical field? And what advice do you have for undergrad or undergrad students? So the first question is, how have I overcome with uh, women and minorities in the health field? How, how have you come to difficulties minorities and women face in the medical field? Um, being an advocate, definitely hearing a voice, uh, hearing the voice of the community. The community is very powerful when you're going into research because that is the data that you're gonna be working, yes, the, the population you're gonna be working with depending on what your research is about. But I always tell researchers or people that are wanting to do research, uh, making sure that you know what your purpose is and why you're going into those communities and to be very authentic because you don't want to go into communities and you having them 
they feel like they're used because that's not the goal we're trying to reach. And we're, we want them to participate. We want them to know what's going on. We want the community to know what resources is out there. So I would say advocacy is a very big key um, for change uh, for minorities and underserved populations, um, as well as hearing what can we do as health uh, providers or health uh, care systems? How can we change? Because I did a training for navigators for Illinois Breast and Cervical Cancer Program, and I've talked to navigators in rural areas and urban areas, and I've heard a lot of feedback as well. Uh, some patients uh, may state that the clinic hours are off. I don't typically, uh, I can't come in from a nine to five because I worked those times. So maybe you need to have an extra clinic hour on the weekends, or you may have to have evening hours extension transportation, finding out what are the barriers to care to for people to not receive care so we can help and fix that. Um, and what are we, the health system is not perfect. What can we do to improve it? What can we do to better it? So um, advocacy and just hearing, having a hearing voice uh, to listen and to make change. And then the second one was, what was the question? Oh. Oh, for the last one, would you change anything about your journey to this position? Uh, no, I really wouldn't because all the trials and tests and tribulations I went through led me to where I am today. You know, if I didn't have those challenges with my science classes, if I didn't have challenges, you know, with time management or certain things like that, I don't feel like I would be here at this time today. Uh, I feel that everybody goes through something for a reason and you end up where you end up because that is the route that was given to you and moving forward, pushing through those trials and tribulations makes you a stronger person. I once uh, heard you're born looking like your parents, but you die of how you lived your life as a reflection. And so how you lived your life is how you're gonna be remembered. And so I want to be a legacy and to live life to the fullest and leave a mark for the next generations to come. And that's why I'm talking to young people such as yourselves so you can make a change because you're gonna be getting the baton and you're gonna be moving forward next and making moves. And so uh, I am very honored to be here and I wouldn't change anything. If I move forward, I'm moving forward with my head held high. I may have some stumbles and falls, but at the same time, I'm gonna keep pushing forward because that is what I'm supposed to do. I'm very resilient and I'm gonna keep being resilient by the grace of God. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yes. Um, so I'm going to, um, I, Barbara, you had shared a PowerPoint with me. So I'm going to yes. go ahead and share that. Um, and please feel free to like share anything you want ab about this PowerPoint. I was looking at the photos myself and um, was just very inspired. So. Oh, yes. Okay, great. Um, so the first photo is me at Miles Square Inglewood where I was talking to uh, individuals. We were at a community health fair for back to school event actually, passing out book bags, passing out resources. And so I was talking to uh, specifically those individuals about mammogram screenings and how important it is to get screened and any other things or smoking cessation. We have registered individuals too for the Illinois Tobacco Quit Line, which is a program for individuals that want counseling one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and that's funded through the American Lung Association program. And then um, the next photo in the middle, I was a public speaker uh, at a community engagement event for Peer Plus. Uh, Phyllis Rogers, is, who is the CEO of Peer Plus, uh, I was talking uh, about our resources in the community of, and what our resources are for the University of Illinois Cancer Center. So uh, that was like a meet and greet. So it was really fun and, and impactful. Um, and the next one uh, is a smoking cessation bingo. Uh, we were on the west side of Chicago of one of the housing facilities in the Garfield area and had fun and interactive game day. We had free lunch, we had prizes 
and just individuals learning ways to quit smoking and what resources are out there for them as well if they want to and then also how important it is to have a primary care provider you know you start off when you're um your primary care provider should be the person that knows all about your health. And then if so happens you need a specialty doctor, then that's when you'll get referred. But I talk to individuals about low dose CT scans for individuals that wanna do uh, lung cancer screenings, which starts at 55. And depending on if how long you smoked and when you stop smoking and how many packs per year you smoked, you could qualify to get a low dose CT scan depending on your insurance coverage as well. So I did talk to individuals about that. It was really fun. Okay, and the next uh, on the top left, uh, I was a registering someone. We had a community and needs assessments. Uh, we were at Fiesta de Soul. It's a health fair, uh, usually in the summertime. They usually do every year. Uh, and so I was doing a community needs assessment led by uh, Dr. Leslie Carnahan. And we talked about uh, ways uh, for community engagement and outreach, but we also wanted the feedback of community members. So we had uh, some questions for individuals to fill out of what they want to see improved in their community, what changes, what um, issues that they see in their community. Was it um, gun violence? Was it cancer? Was it any uh, lack of education? Because we want to hear back from community members. That's why we're researchers, because we want to see what else can we improve or what can we work on, but or what are we doing well in the community? Do you feel like you have a clinic in your community or a provider that you trust? So we did community needs assessments. Um, that's what I talked about before too. It's important when you're doing um, your research or want to do any work in communities to do a community environmental scan, environmental scan or a community needs assessment. And then um, the second picture is um, I was a moderator for um, APHA, which is American Public Health Association. Now it's in 2018, I was representing University of Michigan Community Health Based Public Health Caucus. And I was very proud because I was that was my first time speaking at APHA and moderating for other guest speakers. Um, and I love an APHA. I've been at APHA for about three, three times, I think, so far. It's been different areas and parts of the United States. Um, but I was able to uh, speak and represent on the University of Illinois Cancer Center and the University of Michigan. And then uh, the top right was taking a picture with Staley for the Bears Tackle on Cancer. That was in 2019. And I had my compassion turn on because I consider as a caregiver. Uh, because I have family that have had cancer, such as my father or my grandmother. But if you were a survivor, you had a different word on your shirt. But it was a very fun event, very eventful memories. And uh, just to continue to doing the work, I just enjoy having individuals smile and just to see that they are getting the resources that they need. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Barbara. And we are exactly on time. So um, I just want to say again, thank you so much for speaking with us today, for sharing your story, for sharing your experiences, and for all of your advice. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to say anything, like Maggie, if you want to say anything. Um, otherwise, yeah. I, I just want to say thank you so much. You are such an inspiration. Um, I just knew there was something special about you the first time I met you. Um, and so I'm so glad that you said yes today. You took the time on a Saturday morning to come and talk to us. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. It's been a pleasure. I mean, I'm definitely honored to be here. And thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Nemot, for just inviting me. And on behalf of the Cancer Center, I thank the staff that supports me as well. Um, I just enjoy talking to individuals to let them know my story so they can just share uh, resources and uh, information as well and take home something to resonate with. And uh, moving forward, I just continue to hope to keep in touch. Thank you so much. Yes, definitely. Thank, thank you, you everyone for coming in. And um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for your support. Yeah. Hey. This session was recorded, so we'll be sending out that recording um, within the next week. Um, but yeah, thank you all and hope you enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.